aunt of your niece? You are the brother of my uncle, are you not? Yes, I am. Therefore, you are the brother-in-law of my uncle's wife, my aunt. Toast. The Chinese have many strange and delicate devices, my children, for making people tell the truth when they are unwilling. And it's to you that he's talking with that awful, thin, sinister voice of his. Your flesh just creeps with horror. Your heart is thumping. You're almost choking. The devil, the fiendish, wicked devil. How on earth did you ever come to get into this infernal, shadowy house? How? Once again, Western Electric and a good talkie have got you in their spell. That was an advertisement placed in popular newspapers in the 1930s by Western Electric, one of the firms which originated talking pictures. The advertisement tells us a lot about the cinema in the 30s. It was a place where you could be caught in Western Electric's spell and believe you were actually in Fu Manchu's infernal, shadowy house. Simply projecting films to an audience was not enough. We're in the world of show business. It was necessary for the cinema designer to create a suitably escapist mood to help suspend the audience's sense of disbelief. And surely this explains why ornament played such an important part in cinema design. This is the Granada Tooting, designed by Komisayevsky in 1931. The image of the cathedral is not as preposterous as it may seem at first. Like ecclesiastical architecture, the cinema exploited ornament to achieve a precise psychological function. However much all this may have been reviled by the advocate of pure modern architecture, we see that ornament served an important function in cinema design. It wouldn't have been there otherwise, as the cinema had to be profitable and competitive, which meant keeping capital costs as low as possible. So, with all its ornament, the cinema had to be more finely functional than most international-style buildings with their much-vaunted functionalist aesthetic. The powers of artist, decorator, and technician had to be exploited to their full to waft the audience into the world of celluloid fantasy. Who are we going to be this time? The Marquis and Marquise de Beau. And don't forget your accent. <laughs> your bump of intelligence has been a dance up to now. Cut the panning, will you? You're so remote and so restrained. Why are you scared you'll be the same? For nothing venture, nothing gain. Please use your imagination. But the origins of the cinema were more humble. The earliest form of purpose-built cinema was the fairground sideshow. These were popular in the first decade of the century and continued up to the beginning of World War I. Moving pictures exhibitors had to compete with other fairground sideshows. Dancing girls and powerful steam organs were there to build up expectation and keep a crowd interested while a film was being shown inside. Here the girls actually swing right out over the audience's heads. A typical travelling cinema consisted of the wagon opened out. One side provides the front platform and, on the other side, sloping wooden struts are attached to provide a platform for the seats. Notice the projection box. All this would then be covered by canvas. Here it is, dressed up with its power supply provided by the traction engine, tastefully disguised on the right. These early cinemas could be quite substantial and in many respects did not differ very much from the first permanent buildings. Here is one of the earliest permanent cinemas, the Electric Cinema Theatre in Portobello Road, London, built in 1905. The plasterwork on the first floor it has gone, but the ornamental dome and richly ornamented podium are intact. Gone are the dancing girls and other fairground attractions, but the design is essentially similar. These wooden blinds can be raised to reveal this open-air ticket hall. From here, you move through these doors into a small vestibule. 
you then turn left into the auditorium. The walls and ceiling are richly ornamented. The screen is framed by a theatrical proscenium arch. Here, the projection box is housed above the vestibule and presents less fire risk. Most of the lighting seems to have been originally gas, but electricity was used for the projector arc lamps and, it seems, to power two fans above the ceiling which extract air through these perforated panels. I don't know if the fans are original, but the panels certainly are. Fresh air could be brought in simply by opening windows concealed in the left wall. During the next 25 years, cinema building in this country progressed rapidly, keeping pace with the expansion of America's film industry. Cinemas became larger and more elaborate. We pick up the story again in September 1930, when the last of the big London Astorias opened in Finsbury Park. The architect, Edward Stone, was faced with an irregular shaped site on an important road junction. He placed the foyer and vestibule at the apex of the triangle and had to connect them to the auditorium by means of a dog's leg passage. Stone's decision to place the entrance foyer at the apex of the triangular site created the happy effect of disguising the real bulk of the building. The perspective from this main approach gives the impression that the whole building is faced in white faience. In fact, Stone only faced this small wedge. The rest consists of austere brickwork. The facade is restrained and functional. It has hardly any ornament and is quite different from, for example, this Egyptian facade in Islington of a year later. Through the main doors, we come into the ticket hall. It has ticket windows at the sides. Hidden strip lighting behind the cornices throws light onto the rough plaster ceiling. And in the center, this gold star light fitting. After buying your ticket, you go through a second pair of doors into the foyer. The color scheme there is rich but muted, with reds, mauves, and gold. If we turn to our left, we can see the dog's leg passage going off ahead of us to the stalls. But we're going up to the grand circle. From the top of the stairs, a glimpse back to the dome through the gilded railings. We are now above the entrance and can see right across the dome to the passage leading to the Moorish Bar. Above the red tiled roofs, hidden blue lights define the dark blue ceiling so that it looks like a real sky at night. Mysterious grills, even the ladies room on the left has a door like a Moorish harem. Then these glowing red lamps and yellow and orange standards. On each side of the bar are the entrances to the Grand Circle. The screen is surrounded by a huge imitation brick arch. The spandrels in dark red with gold foliage, flanked by a checkerboard pattern and rather tame lions. And above, the bridge, 
which could be filled with fearless dancing girls as part of a, of a variety act between films. On either side of this great proscenium are the Moorish villages, once lit with many appropriately coloured lights. under a night sky with randomly twinkling stars. But the illusion of the balmy Mediterranean night with its exotic foliage would not be worth the fibrous plaster it's made of without the backup of the cinema's mechanical and electrical services to waft the warm night air through the palm fronds. Before going any further, I should explain that this type of cinema represents an English version of the much more spectacular American atmospheric cinemas of the previous decade. These combined exotic open-air settings with the very latest in air conditioning. Of these, the architect John Emerson wrote, We visualize a dream, a magnificent amphitheater under a glorious moonlit sky in an Italian garden, in a Persian court, in a Spanish patio, or in a mystic Egyptian temple yard all canopied by a soft, moonlit sky. Before the age of readily available central heating, a warm, controlled atmosphere was a rarity and simply unknown to most people. It was the provision of this atmosphere which constituted one of the greatest attractions of the cinema. One shilling and ninepence a night was a cheap price to pay to be kept warm and to be entertained by films and variety at the same time made into a bargain. But consider the problem of heating a cinema. Generally, the system employed was the so-called plenum system, invented by William Kay in Glasgow in the last century. Basically, the plenum system sets out to make the building into an enormous pneumatic machine, with the interior constantly maintained at a pressure greater than the atmosphere. Air is forced around the building by large, centrally placed fans. In a balanced system, some of the vitiated air is extracted from the building, while fresh air is sucked into the system. The temperature is controlled by mixing the cold, fresh air with recirculated air heated by steam from the boiler room. The first thing that you notice on entering the building is that there are two sets of flush-fitting doors at the foyer vestibule. These are there to act as a valve to maintain the seal in the pressurized building. Because the outside doors were often open, it was impossible to heat this space by the plenum system. So, on either side of the side ticket windows, it's not surprising to find that grills hide conventional hot water radiators. But once beyond the second doors, the plenum system takes over. In this schematic diagram, the white dotted line shows the mixture of fresh and recirculated air coming into the foyer under the dome at two levels. On the first floor, it's di distributed from under the rim of the dome through these little grills, and from behind the coving on the inside, where there are also hidden lights. And below, we find the same grills in the bays in the foyer. Here, Edward Stone and his designers, Tommy Summerford and Ewan Barr, continued the grills around the wall, although they are filled in and serve no function other than that of a decorative cornice. At foot level, there are extractor vents where the stale, vitiated air is drawn out to be either recirculated or blown out of the exhaust on the roof. Closer inspection reveals another input grill in the first segment of the Moorish arch. We can see the air coming in from the top and being drawn out from floor level in the diagram. If we follow the black dotted line, 
showing the vitiated air as it is drawn out at floor level through this section of the foyer and vestibule areas, you will notice how it meets the thin black lines at thermostats, circles marked with a capital T. The thermostats play a vital part in controlling the temperature in this part of the building. A lot of heat may be needed when it is empty, while the audience is in the auditorium, but the heat could become unbearable when up to 3,000 people crush into a restricted space during the interval. When the temperature rises above a certain point, the thermostats shut off the supply of heated air. They are connected to these heating units by compressed air lines, the black lines on the diagram, where they control the temperature of air coming into the building. You get the same system in the Moorish bar or crush foyer. The extracted air on the lower left activates a thermostat which controls the input of air between the eaves. This climatic control is, of course, essential to maintain the open air illusion. This is the larger machine which deals with the auditorium. You can see the white dotted line representing the mixture of fresh and recirculated air being distributed to the top of the grand circle and the back of the stalls where it enters through the coving. The black dotted line shows vitiated air being drawn out at low level to be taken back to the machine for recirculation. On the left, a controlled amount of vitiated air is drawn up from above the screen to be extracted through the roof. It was always considered desirable that the fresh air should come in from behind the audience's heads, thus avoiding it blowing in their faces. Now, let's look at the air handling machine itself. It's situated in the plenum chamber, which is just above and behind the crush bar in the middle of the building. You can see it on the roof with the heavy black duct on the left carrying air to the foyer and the brick-faced duct to the right plunging down to the crush bar. Essentially, the room contains the two air handling units. They are the original machines installed by the carrier company in 1930. Carriers are well known as pioneers of air conditioning, but the system at the Astoria is, properly speaking, only heating and ventilation. Air conditioning cools and humidifies the air as well as just heating it. On the left, you can see the larger machine which we were looking at on the diagram. The machine is divided into two sections through which air is drawn by the fan. It turns at a fairly leisurely constant speed of 670 RPM. The part on the left handles the recirculated air and that on the right, the fresh air which is drawn through grills on the side of the building. In this case, the small grill on the left. Inside, the air enters this chamber. It's then drawn through the preheater. Steam is driven through copper tubes with aluminium fins to heat the air. The preheater prevents cold air from icing up the machine and warms the air so it can better absorb water in the next chamber, which is the air washer. This takes up the left part of the unit and is reached through the door on the left. We're now inside, looking through the water sprayers which clean the air towards the back of the preheater steam coil which is protected from the water by the vertical vanes. Looking the other way, you can see the sump with its ball cock, which keeps a constant amount of water in the system. The water passes through a filter and is then recirculated. The air is then heated again by the minimum heater, controlled by one of the thermostats on the roof. The amount of fresh air to be mixed with recirculated air is now controlled by dampers. The recirculated air passes through the main heater steam coil, which is controlled by a hand-operated valve. You can see the main heater steam coil on the left and the dampers on the right. These are operated by arms attached to valves controlled by the compressed air lines. A great deal of skilled control is needed here and in the boiler room, as you can see from the amount of dials and valves which the attendant has to keep an eye on. Next to the plenum chamber is the electric power room. Here, there are transformers and switching gear to supply the different circuits. 440 volts with the plenum fan motors. 
Inside the cupboard is this huge mercury pool rectifier, which supplied direct current to the old projectors, which have now been replaced by these modern ones. In case of power failure and because of fire risk, there had to be an emergency lighting system, and the power for this was supplied from the battery room. Besides this, other circuits supplied the hundreds of house lights, lighting effects, and other services. This is just one of the walls of the switch room, which controls the house lights. These foyer house lights are a dull orange. The general effect of the lighting is at once sumptuous and muted. These ceiling lights with their white glass are hung from bright gold, star-shaped surrounds. Light reflects off the shining gold surrounds and is absorbed and diffused by the stippled and circled plaster. Behind the screen, which could be raised up, is a big stage for variety acts. It has the normal theatrical flies with their usual complex system of hoists and spotlights. Here, on the left, we find another important switching center. This switchboard controls the auditorium lights and effects. This switch worked the projector, which was used to create the cloud effects. The Moorish villages were originally lit with different colored lights to enhance the exotic atmosphere. It's difficult now to capture the effect in black and white. When the house lights were down, dim amber bracket lights glowed in the aisles, providing the necessary low-level lighting for the performance. And there were also these safety lights at the end of a row of seats. In the Astoria, we can see the meeting of mechanical services and aesthetic effect combined in the aim of creating an artificial atmosphere. But looking back, we can sense that the emphasis on decoration in the Astoria was an historical aberration. It seems that if the atmospheric cinema was to continue, then it could only become more and more elaborate. The engineers won the day. The type of cinema which was to create the norm was the product of an enterprising businessman, Oscar Deutsch, and his architects, Harry Whedon and partners, who created the Odeon chain. The source of the Odeon style was Mendelssohn's Berlin Universum, suitably adapted for application to the provincial British High Street. These cinemas were designed to look like machines. The clear, precise lines of the Odeon style romanticize the mechanical component of cinema architecture. In them, there is no place for decorative frivolity. But in the atmospheric cinema, we have seen that what looks apparently frivolous can be functional. For if Gropius and Le Corbusier created a willful aesthetic to meet the needs of their tastes, then in the Astoria, Edward Stone used flaps, valves, grills, dampers, and boilers to satisfy a large audience. And what could be more functional than that? Mm -hmm.